What I love most about the genre that has been my home since I was but a small child is that it's a gift that keeps on giving. Discovering old movies I've never seen, watching classics as I age, and appreciating different aspects, or giving a film I never really liked a second chance, and finding something to love. The passage of time, the age of experience, all filtered through the magic of movies. So on today's episode of The Black Sheep, I want to explore a flick that didn't quite win me over when I first saw it. Maybe it was the less than stellar experience I had in the theater. Which, can we just admit that the movie theater has become the new mall? I've been watching movies on the big screen since I was six years old. People hang out, talk, dick around their phones, and eat. Nobody's there for the storytelling anymore. It is a f***ing mall. Let the theater become something small and personal, like the Alamo Draft House or the Music Box in Southport. A place for movie fans where they cheer when they should, laugh when they should, and shut up for the rest of it. Because here's the deal, streaming will win out as it should. Because at this point, and for quite a long time, people can ruin a movie when they have no interest in it. But a few years ago, I gave this another watch, and I'm here to tell you I fell head over heels. A dark, twisted, slow burn acid trip that hooks you from the very start and never lets go. Today, I'm showing some love for Rob Zombie's, and eh, maybe Magnum Opus, The Lords of Salem. Set over the course of six days, Lords of Salem follows the mental downfall of a disc jockey named Heidi, as she is used by the Salem Witch Bloodline as a vessel to bring on the Antichrist. Coming off his stint with the Halloween series, which I am a fan of the dark, brutal, and miserable sequel, by the way, Zombie was wise enough to jump out of his comfort zone and try something far more slower paced, and amp up the dreadful atmosphere in place of his refined brutality. See, to me, this is Rob Zombie's altered states with witches. Filtered through his love of the Italian supernatural horror. It should be said that Lords was his smallest film, well, at the time of course, coming in at somewhere around 1.5 million, with his agreed upon masterpiece, Devil's Rejects, at a solid 7 million. And so the movie you and I have seen is, is quite compromised compared to what was originally planned. Zombie, along with B.K. Evanson, wrote a novelization together, which was the shit back in the day. Seriously, I don't know if you read these as kids, but go back and get on the Halloween novelizations just to see how iconic and unique these books got. But the novel of Lords gives a clear indication that a bigger and meaner story was originally planned. The poor guy had to cut down scenes with Sid Haig and Michael Berryman and ax Richard Lynch for health reasons. So let's give him a little bit of credit because he's always willing and ready to kill his baby, as they say, if need be. But for my money, this toned down and restrained story gives Zombie more credit as a director because it goes against, eh, somewhat, his more upfront tendencies. Now listen, I know the guy is polarizing, and uh, I have enough problems to sit around and try to convince you otherwise. A lot of Fuck criticism em. of you. Fuck him. Okay. But I truly believe that even his most staunch critics can find something in Lords of Salem to love. Rob Zombie is no stranger to the bizarre, but Lords marks the first time he went full supernatural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Satan from House and Michael's mom slash horse from Halloween 2 dipped their toes into the outer realm. But Lords is where he goes to 11. These go to 11. In this, this is where he's at his most zen. Starting Monday and ending on Saturday, we watch the slow mental decline of Heidi, played by his wife, Sherry Moon Zombie. All focused around a mysterious record mailed specifically to her, a nod to the satanic panic from the 80s. This record has an ancient tune, the tune of the devil, that puts her and all other women with a Salem lineage under a spell. Oh, also spoilers going forward. I can't really defend this without going full measure. I chose a half measure. When I should have gone all the way. Noted, sir. Noted. This spell kicks off a hundred minutes of weird, dreamlike surrealism, which is perfectly encapsulated in one of my favorite scenes. Heidi wanders into the vacant apartment down the hall, drawn to something within, only to be met with an empty room with a glowing crucifix and a beast behind. Mm -hmm. 
We get a lot of dream sequences, which would normally bother me, but here they are presented as Heidi's descent into madness. Partially true, these dreams are used as a warning and as a bridge to the great unknown, where her eventual demise awaits. Some will say that this is style over substance, and uh, eh, maybe. But film is a visual medium, and a lot is done here to usher in a sense of dread and impending doom. Character-wise, this is the most likable group Zombie has populated a story with. I've always fought against the avalanche of criticism that his white trash stigma surrounding his flawed heroes and villains is worthless. Hey, I know my shit. I have a lot of family from Joliet. Trust me. Have you ever been? Imagine the town from nothing but trouble. Only, eh, well, yeah, it's just that. Joliet. Ugh. Heidi is a recovering addict who was just born into the wrong bloodline. Sherry Moon Zombie may not have much of a dynamic range, but acting-wise, this is her best role. Far more relaxed and toned down, she's able to work within Heidi's struggle and make her sympathetic without coming off corny or cringy. Of course, Lords is populated with one hell of a supporting cast. Jeff Daniel Phillips is a sweetheart as Whitey and crushes hard on his co-worker Heidi. He's easygoing and f***ing lovable, man. They never get together despite his good intentions, and uh, listen, as a guy, I think we can all relate. The one that got away, literally. <laughs> Ken Foray is somewhat underused as Herman, but he fills out the trifecta of being the other funny and smooth co-worker. He doesn't really do much here, but he still elevates any film he's in. Now, the stars here are the witches themselves, old and new. The landlord of Heidi's building and her friends are responsible for the satanic record and are slowly driving Heidi into a state of submission. Dee Wallace, Judy Geeson, and Patricia Quinn own it. Geeson's character, Lacey Doyle, is such a great villain. She's warm and fighting with just the right amount of malice that you yourself would miss with an ounce of trust. Megan is just straight up evil and her palm reading scene is a masterclass in how to nail a monologue. Patricia Quinn's over here giving us her Glengarry Glen Ross. The wicked thoughts burning inside your head and exploding in the juices between your legs. The darkness within your very soul, the only reason you exist. Oh, have I got your attention now? And of course, D. F***ing Wallace, giving us a good turn using her motherly love as a vicious weapon. And I haven't even mentioned the scariest and most unnerving part of the whole thing. The queen herself. Meg Foster is the old witch and Satan enthusiast, Margaret Morgan. The scenes set during the Salem witch trials and the events leading up to them are quick but sweet. Foster leans into her character and presents the lead witch in a very feral way. Naked, covered in mud, her presence is genuinely creepier than it has any right being. All of them are presented as surprisingly grounded in a way a coven would look and act if they lived off the land and spent their free time worshiping Satan. These scenes are intense, cruel, and downright macabre. All I'm saying is that everything done here to delve into the zombie-fied mythology to flesh out the witches should get far more praise than it does. For a tight 100 minute runtime, nothing feels rushed or shoehorned in. Though Whitey and Herman aren't quite equipped to deal with what they assume is Heidi slipping back into her old habits, Francis Mathias is our unlikely hero, played by the great Bruce Davidson, a chill old man who's a historian and novelist on the Salem Witch Trials, and who's so disturbed by the Lord's song that he immediately starts to dig into its history. Hey, it's refreshing to see a guy with his best intentions and willingness to help be Mr. Henderson himself. Too bad the witches bash his brains in with a skillet. Man, Harry will never recover from this. The Lords are playing a free show and this is where we go full batshit crazy. Zombie and cinematographer Brandon Trost end on a high note with the show being Heidi's final conversion and the birth of the Antichrist. The pregnancy scene is a small monster goblin with dick tentacles that she shakes around engulfed in a trippy seizure. <laughs> I love it. Honestly, it's weird and off kilter, but it's beautiful, man, it really is. The lush colors and grand scope sell the hell out of the scene. 
The concert is the old witches playing that freaky tune with crude handmade instruments. And also props to John Five and Griffin Boyce for such an uncomfortable sound. And Johnny Five's fantastic score all around. And all the women from earlier that were entranced strip down and become the altar of the new satanic Virgin Mary. All set to the perfect use of the Velvet Underground's All Tomorrow's Parties. The Lord's of Salem is nihilistic in nature, and Zombie's fascination with witches and refusal to have anyone with a good soul win is brutal, honest, and on brand. It's all done with a laser focus that ends up being his most personal and interesting story. A tale about the grim and savage resurgence of one's history and how everything that goes around will come back around. Even if you're not a fan of the man's style or output, one can't deny the forward thinking and execution of the Lords of Salem. If the Virgin Mary Antichrist and many monster goblin dicks don't sell it, I don't know what will. I wanna pack the house and then burn it down. Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.